Wow. It's always hard to follow your own introduction. Um, I'm often wondering who are the people that they are talking about. I would love to meet him as well. He seems like a really great guy. Um, <clears throat> MBCC, it is great to be with you this morning. Pastor Herman has already said it, but he is a, a big brother of mine. He is someone who I look up to. You have a gem, so I know he's not here, but can we just celebrate the angel of this house, <laughs> Pastor Herman, who is a, a, an amazingly gracious individual, taking in a younger minister, a young brother, uh, kind of coming to the area at the same time, who's always generous in offerings, giving of wisdom, and sharing what he has learned and the journey that you all are taking. But also, like, can we just be honest? He's just cool. Like, it's a, he got a swag about him. Some people just kind of got a little, and uh, so I'm thankful for all the ways that he's doing, all the things that he does. And also, I want to celebrate you all 10 years. Oh, I feel like you should have a little bit more joy about that. 10 years. What a gift. Uh, and I know that there's a, a theme of reflecting, reaching, and rejoicing. We will make sure that we stay connected with that. But 10 years is no small feat. Uh, in a season, especially where churches are closing doors, where uh, ministries are trying to figure out what they can let out, you all are still in the growth process, and you have amazing things ahead. So I'm excited to be here and a part of all of that. Now that the pleasantries are over, I will get to the Word of God. Uh, if you will, open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 3, and I'll be reading verses 20 and 21. And while you get that, let me just also acknowledge, Pastor Dan, thank you, and all of the support team that has been so great. You all do uh, great care for individuals that come in, and I want to acknowledge all of those that have helped. Um, even those that are in the background, help them make sure we got stuff on the screens. Uh, you guys have been um, wonderful. All right, Ephesians chapter 3, starting at verse 20. And am I right? Is it customary? Do you all stand when you read the Word of God? you mind standing for me? Uh, this is a practice that we have at Emmanuel. It's a way that we love to show God reverence, uh, that we stand at the very utterance of the word. And it reads, Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church, and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. As you're taking your seats, help me introduce the title for today's message. Everyone say, The God, the God. of More. Amen. The God of More. One of the things that I love, and, and I'll, I'll just address this up front, uh, Pastor Herman mentioned I am a, a Baptist preacher. I come from the African-American tradition, and all that is to say is that we do a little bit of talking back to one another. Uh, that may not be your practice, I get it, but that's mine. And one of the challenges is when people don't talk back to me, I'm not sure if you're getting it, right? And so that means I talk longer, I preach longer, because I'm wondering if you got it. Uh, but if you want to make sure that I can stick to this 34 minutes, minutes that they have on screen uh, to tell me that I need to be out of here. If you just say a few things back to me, I'll know you're getting it, and I'll keep on course, all right? So if you just throw an amen here or there, if you say, I hear you, preacher, any of those things are welcome so that I can make sure I stay on my guard and do what I'm supposed to do. Amen? amen. All right, all right. I think we're going to do fine together today. Now, when you think of, or when many of us may think of, the word more, I imagine a variety of different ideas could come to your mind. If you think of more, you could be a person that is uh, dealing with keeping your job in the Bay where there are a variety of layoffs. And the word more could easily mean more work, but not more pay. Just trying to hold on to what you got and praying that God will allow you to preserve your position. If you are a young family or a young couple preparing or just had a baby, more could mean, I wish I was getting more 
sleep. Amen. Somebody knows about it, right? Uh, before this child came, who I want to say is a blessing from God, I was able to rest. I was able to, to see the backs of my eyelids. Now, all of a sudden, I'm unable to see those things. And, uh, and I need more of God in that sleep ministry. Amen. But for the variety of us, when we think about more, it typically takes on a positive idea. It is a positive meaning. If more is situated by itself, the majority of us take it positively. And it's that way that I would love for us to hold it today. When we think of the God of more. Now, <clears throat> My children have grown. They'll be here uh, at the 11 o'clock service, and uh, thank God for my family. They, they're not at the point where they like to do two services with me yet, so keep praying for me. I'm trying to develop a more spiritual family. I want them to, to love the Lord more. Um, <clears throat> But that being said, I remember when they initially, uh, when my, 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 my youngest, my oldest now, uh, son was growing up and, you know, as young family, you're trying to be able to communicate with a child that can't speak. And we would go through these things of trying to figure out what are sometimes the, the things that you're communicating as opposed to trying to point or just crying. They would teach these young families how to use small bits of sign language, right? Like for a, a young child, when they want more food or more to drink, they would do this thing, right? Like you do this. This means more, right? Everybody, like, you do this. This means more. And so we were, right, you can go ahead and do it. You can go ahead and try it out. There you go. Go ahead, more. Yep. And so... We were teaching my son this, and slowly but surely, he kind of picked it up, and then all of a sudden, he never stopped. <laughs> says, Every day, all day. I don't know what you want more of now, son. Like, is it more air you need? I don't know, because this is it. But there was, it was this really great thing. He was able to communicate so positively when he wanted more, more milk, more food, and sometimes we just didn't have more. We couldn't give him the more that he wanted. And then if we get older, we have some that, uh, you know, you might know, learn sign language. And for sign language, what more looks like is this, right? That more is when you take it up. You go beyond. There is more for us to have. And as I think about this, I, I'm, I'm amazed that we serve a God that is able to provide us more. And, I, and I, I hope I can get you there. I hope I can get you as excited about it because we actually serve a God who is able to give us more. Everybody say he's able. God is able. In a world and a uh, society where we're constantly running into people or things or opportunities or institutions that let us down, where we question their ability to bring about what we are hoping for, we actually serve a God that is able. This word in the Greek, what it talks about able, it means that it has the capacity or the ability to accomplish whatever is set in front of it. It has the capacity and the ability to accomplish what is set in front of it. And as we get to this text, we are listening to the writer tell us, as we close out the third chapter of Ephesians, that God is able. Now, this would sound different if the writer was sitting on an island, maybe sipping a non-alcoholic drink, we're saved, we're spiritual, we're going to do that, right? If, if the writer is sitting in a penthouse scribing this or is atop of one of the world's best institutions, this would sound a certain way. However, the writer, which is Ascribed to Paul, it's often believed by many scholars that Paul may actually not have been able to complete the text, but it may have been one of his disciples that finished the text for him because he was in prison when he started writing this. That Paul from a prison cell being held on unfair charges 
looking and wondering how his life would come to its culmination. In fact, it is believed that Paul may have actually passed away or been killed in the process of writing to this community, is now writing about a God that is able. And I want you to hear this because the writer is letting us know that God's ability is not just predicated on our own personal experiences. That God is still able even if I'm in prison. That God is able when things don't go the way that I desire for them to. That God is able when I'm in a, a difficult or precarious position. That God is able when things get difficult. That God is able. No matter how difficult or how challenging life is in front of me. And in fact, we may learn something if we are able to utter those words when it seems like we shouldn't say it. When it seems like we should be questioning and wondering about God. When it seems like we should be walking away from God. The truth is our faith is exemplified if we can say in a moment of everything going counter to the direction that we want to go that God is able. We serve an able God. Paul writing that this God is able. This God is able to a community that are watching apostles and disciples being killed and martyred. This God is able when the community in many ways is hiding from local officials. When their understanding is not even rightly cared about or appreciated in the larger context of society, Paul is not concerned about what everything else is happening, Paul has a way of now looking and seeing God's ability. And I dare say Paul has been able to do this because Paul has seen God before. That Paul is not just wondering now. This is not the first time that life has been difficult for Paul. Paul has gone through enough to be able to say, I've seen God both in my good times and in my bad times. I've learned to live with a whole bunch and I've learned to live on a whole little. In fact, this is the same writer that will tell us in Philippians 13 that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Why? Because God is able. I've been shipwrecked, but God is still able. I've been beaten, but God is still able. I've had people turn their back on me, but God is still able. In fact, I've done ministry with people that didn't show up for me when I wanted them to. In fact, I've lost relationships. Paul and Barnabas used to be co-laborers in the gospel. They lost relationship because of people messing over them. And he still says, God is able. God is able. And God is not only able, but for some oddity, some, some, some wisdom that seems to go beyond what I would do, God has nestled his ability and power in us. Did you hear the scripture? It says all this glory goes to the God who is able. Through his mighty power at work within us. That God is not only able, but that God works through us. What does this mean for God to work through us? The powerful God, full of capacity and ability has now locked that power not into you individually, but into us, the collection of individuals to which God calls the church. The God has made it so that we realize and experience God's power Not when we walk by ourselves, but when we come together, individuals, 
into singular collective to us. Sometimes the reason that we miss some of the beauty of God's power working is because we've stepped away from the us. And I know new beginnings is different. And so I won't speak about new beginnings, but I'll talk about other churches. Other churches I've been to. Not even just my own church. Emmanuel, I love you. And I know this is not about you. But oftentimes we've turned church into the individual personal uh, benefits that we want. We show up to church not because we care about church or what the church is doing, but we care about what the church is providing to me. And the church is only as good as its benefit to me. And when I don't feel that the church is personally benefiting me, then I can have all types of issues and I can lift up all types of challenges with the church because I've made church about me. In fact, I dare say some of us have utilized our relationship with God to be personal and about me. Me and God are on good terms when God gives me all the things that I desire, when God is answering my prayers the way that I desire for them to be answered, when God is moving in the way that I think God should be moving. But if God would so happen to move or do or act or function in a way that is counter to what I have asked for, now all of a sudden I have ought with God. I stand as if I can tell God through my own wisdom that God's wisdom is not good enough, that God has made a mistake, that God has offended me. Can I tell you we've lost the idea of us? And when we lose us, we lose our ability to realize this power that is generating. But God says, not only am I able, I'm able to do amazing things through us. Do you know how hard it is to get people to align on anything? (laughs) Have you ever tried to go out for lunch or dinner? You're not even trying to change the world. You just want to pick a restaurant. You want to find one cuisine that that everybody could agree on. And, And sometimes it's not even outside of your family. It's just your nuclear family. It is you, your your spouse and children. And you got four different, five different locations and desires. And then people start to lobby their desires against yours. Well, you remember last time we went out, we went and chose what you had. So it seems as if this should be the time I get what I would want, right? Yet, God has made it so that the power of God is connected to the church when the church does the thing that does not seem natural. Figures out how to make a us out of each one of you. Why? Because it's easy for us to all want our own thing. In fact, I dare say, it takes the power of God to even make an us. Thus, the power of God to make an us then is able to work through us to accomplish the things that God is already able to do. This is transformative. Because it reminds each one of us that it's more than just about us. And not only does God do this, not only is God able, not only does God lock now God's power in our ability to unify and work together, God says, when these things happen, now God does infinitely more. Everybody say more. More. That God is able to do more. I know what God is able to do, but God now is able to do more. And I love the way that the writer says it, right? He is able to do more than you can ask or think. That God has the ability to accomplish more then you could ask or think. 
So as mentioned, I, I, we have an after-school program, and one of the things I love about the after-school program is that we get a chance, or I get a chance, to be around uh, students, right, younger students. We, this is a kind of a junior highish. We're going down to some elementary grades. And one of the things I have experienced in working with children is they have a great capacity to ask for things. I feel like adulthood trains us out of asking for certain things, right? Like, you learn that it's inappropriate to ask for everything that you want. Like, sometimes you shouldn't even ask. You may want to, but you have learned, you have been cultured, and society has taught you. At a certain level, you can't just ask for everything that you want. So you weigh it, you figure out how much relationship you have, and you determine what are the proper places for me to ask for things. Children don't have all of those parameters. They have not gained all of those social cues yet. And what they do is ask for everything. If food is being provided and they don't see the food that they personally desire, they believe that they can ask for it and it might just appear. I see that you guys have made us tacos and where those are good, I have a taste for a burger. Would you happen to have a burger today? No, we don't have burgers today because we have tacos, and the tacos took up the, the menu for the burgers. Ah, well, do you have? No, what we do have is <laughs> what you see right here. The writer says, no matter what you can ask for, God is able to do more. And then... He says, I'll go one beyond that. We talked about the kids being willing to say all the things, but God could also do more than you could think. So when you've bumped into the social cues that tell you you shouldn't open your mouth and say something, but you know that you thought it, God is able to go beyond that. If you could conceive it in your mind, if you could put a thought towards it, our God is able to do more than even what you thought about. That when you think that you're putting a limitation on God or when you think you are blowing the thing all up and you're doing more than you ever could have done, God is able to say, I can do more than that. If you're crazy enough to meet other crazy folk and y'all talk about crazy things and come up with even crazier ideas, the fact that you thought about it, the fact that you spoke it means that God can still do more than what you came up with. Our God is able. Our God is able to accomplish infinitely more than we can ever ask or think. And that's the God that we serve. That's the God that NBC serves. That's the God that has been working through you all for this past 10 years. And whether you're new to the ministry or you've been here the whole time, it does not matter. The same truth is there. And not only that, it means that God has not run out of God's ability to do the more. I've been in church my whole life, and, and I've been in faith almost my whole life. I was one of those young children that chose Jesus for myself. I know that may not be everybody, but I was going to church by myself at like eight or nine, like waking my parents up, take me to church. I just love Jesus. Apparently, God knew well before I did that he called me to ministry. I'm going out. I'm following God. And one of the things that happens, especially for me, is after I've seen God do so much, if I'm honest, I wonder how much more is left. God, you brought me out of this bad situation before. I know that you are able, but the fact that you did it then makes me actually question, will you do it again? It's not that I don't think that you have the ability to. It's that since you've already done it, I'm like, how many more times can I expect for you to do the same thing? 
God, I've been to financial challenges where I didn't have enough and resources came in. And I've seen you do this enough. Now I question, now that if I get into that same position, will you do it again? God, you've already done enough in our church. You've already grown us. You've already taken us to new locations. You've already done this. Is there still more that we can accomplish? God, are you really telling me that you care this much about us that you would do even more than what you've already done? And the writer says, if you can ask it, if you can think it, God is able to do more. Now, spiritual maturity shares with us that God's ability to do more doesn't mean God always elects to do it. The writer is reminding us that his situation potentially is dire He's not exactly where he would want to be. But God not responding is not a communication of God's ability. It's a communication of God's will. And God's ability to do more doesn't mean that God always will do more, depending on what God wants us to do. And sometimes the more that God is preparing us for It is the challenge that we go through that prepares us for the more to come. I close with this this thought. Many of you are amazingly familiar with caterpillars and their transformation into butterflies. They go through an entire process, building a cocoon all around them. And there's a moment where they're in the cocoon Well, now they have gone through the full level of transformation. They no longer look like what they once were. They no longer have the same abilities. In fact, they've been given greater ability. But none of that matters because they're still locked into the cocoon. And the only way for the butterfly to get out of the cocoon is to now push against the difficulty of what once was protecting them. They're pushing on it, trying to break through the very thing that at one point was there for their protection. And one of the things that may happen is an onlooker may come by, see the struggle and desire to help, go in and break open the cocoon for the butterfly to release it earlier, quicker, give it more access to the freedom that comes on the other side of the cocoon. But this actually creates a problem because now, since the cocoon was open quicker, the wings have not built up the strength to be able to carry the butterfly for the rest of its life. Thus, the butterfly actually dies because it can't fly and do the very things that it can do when the more comes because it never went through all of the tension and the difficulty necessary so it could be ready for the more life that was available for it on the other side of the cocoon. Preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying that there are certain situations in our lives that are just like that cocoon. They are difficult and they are challenging and there is no short-circuiting them. There is no quick way around them. There is no quick way to get through them. In fact, the only way to be prepare for the more that God has for us is to go through the difficulty of the now that we're right in. Now unto him that is able. Sometimes you need God to help to strengthen those wings. You need God to allow the difficulty to persist. You need God to teach you how to love somebody. And loving somebody doesn't just show up when you love them. Sometimes the best way to learn how to love somebody is when they are unlovable. It is when they do everything to spite you. It is when they get on your last nerves. It is when they are one of the most difficult people to be around in your life. That's when you learn how to really love. You want to learn how to be patient? That's not just dropped into your lap. No, you are put into positions that try your nerves, get on your last nerves, and you have to learn how to be there. In fact, somebody going to cut you off on the way out of church. (laughs) But it builds in you. And if you're willing to push against it, Work within it. You're able to see the mighty power of God. And we're reminded that God is able. 
that God desires to work through us and that God can accomplish far more than we ever thought or imagined. And this is exemplified in the very person of Jesus Christ. Scripture says that he came that we might have life and that life more abundantly. That all of this is a microcosm for what God has already done in God's son, Jesus. That the reason that we take Jesus by the hand, the reason that Jesus becomes the leader of our life is that Jesus is constantly leading us to the more. This is the good shepherd that leads us to the cool waters. This is the cool good shepherd that now makes sure that we rest in those still waters and we get to those green pastures. This is the type of God that we serve. And NBC, in the next years to come, NBC and what God has for you, I'm excited because God has more for you. God has more for you to be able to do, more for you to be able to accomplish. There are more lives that need to be transformed, more marriages that need to be need to be saved, more children that need to be weird. There are more opportunities for you to grow and see the power of God. In fact, there is more opportunity for you to be involved. Ten years should be telling you, you know what, how am I involved at NBC? What am I doing to help? Pastor Herman didn't ask me to say this, but I'm going to say it for him. He should never have to look for servants. He should never have to look for volunteers. He should never be wondering how we will accomplish something because God does more when he's working through us. And when God does this, you'll sit back five years, ten years from now, and the things that you thought were impossible to accomplish, God would have done it. You would have experienced it because we serve a God of more. God bless you.